So hello, my name is Vitaly um, and this talk is on practical supervisor mode execution and access protection bypasses on Linux. It's not specific to Linux, so you can take the same generic concepts and apply them to other shared user and kernel space operating systems, but all the examples in this talk um, are specific to the Linux kernel. Right, and the general idea is to show that um, by itself, SMEP um, as a kernel protection mechanism can be easily bypassed. So the original talk that I was planning to give was on SMEP execution protection only, but I've extended the material um, to cover SMEP as well, access protection. Um, it's getting more common and um, we've got uh, Broadwell and Skylake processes, so SMEP, uh, SMEP is quite relevant at the moment. Okay, so who am I? Uh, I'm a security researcher I'm from Australia. Um, I work for Spider Labs. And I primarily specialize in exploit development, uh, mostly on POSIX systems. And at the moment, I'm doing research in uh, kernel exploitation and um, various hardening uh, mechanisms. OK, so why are we talking about uh, SMAP and SMAP? So first of all, um, it's a, a stand for Supervisor Mode Execution and Access Protection. The 64-bit uh, CPU features only, so there's no 32-bit support. Um, and they uh, support it uh, from kernel 2.6, right? So we've had support back in 2011, even before we had SMAP, right? Even before we have CPU chips with SMAP support. And uh, if you buy a laptop or a desktop nowadays, um, you'll get at least SMAP, right? Your CPUs are probably uh, at least Ivy Bridge, right? So no one is using Sandy Bridge anymore. So if you've got Ivy Bridge and later, then you've got SMAP. If you've got Broadwell or Skylake, then you've got SMAP access protection as well. I'll talk about the differences, right? And, uh, yeah, so in terms of consumer desktops and laptops, but also VPS uh, hosting providers and cloud service providers uh, switching, up upgrading their architecture and switching to SMAP-enabled CPUs. Okay, so I'd like to start my talk uh, with a demo, actually. Um, a bit unusual, but to show you what SMAP really is. Uh, let me just maybe duplicate my screen, make it easier. Okay, let's do that. Uh, the resolution is horrible. Anyway. So this is a standard Ubuntu installation. Right. Um, first, I'm going to boot this virtual machine without SMAP. So I've got a MacBook, which is, uh, I think it's 2014 model. Uh, it's got an Ivy Bridge, or I think it's got Haswell, actually. So I've got SMAP support enabled in hardware. And I'm using virtual machine VMware. So if your host CPU supports SMAP, then your virtual machine will use SMAP as well. But at the moment, I'll just boot my kernel without SMAP support. So you can provide this no SMAP parameter. Um, by default, it's enabled, right? But I'll just disable it for now. OK. So I've, um, I've written this exploit uh, probably a couple of years ago. Uh, it's actually in uh, the issue is with Perth uh, counters in the kernel. So it's just a typical, um, I think it was out of bounds RA access or something like that, right? And I still keep getting emails from people saying your exploit sucks, it doesn't work, <laughs> right? So here's the reason why. You've got SMEP enabled. So let me show you that this actually works. So this is kernel 3.5. Uh, just to make sure, uh, offset two. All right, so I've got root access. Fine. So now I'm going to boot this kernel normally with SMAP support. So I'm not going to change any parameters. Okay, so let me show you that SMAP is actually enabled, 
right? So you can see that the CPU flag there. And I'll use the same exploits. Uh, let me just make sure that my console is attached. So what I'm doing is basically I'm redirecting all the kernel um, console messages to, to a pipe from my VM to my host, so you can see the oops message, right? Otherwise, it just scrolls and you don't get the full message. Okay, so two. Okay, done. And you can see that the kernel crashed, right? So you get the kernel panic, you get this, uh, your instruction pointer, it's some kernel memory address there, but for the actual um, error message, what you get is, it just says um, it's a double fault. Okay, that's all you get. It doesn't tell you that there was some uh, exploitation attempt or anything like that. You basically get a double fault. So a single page fault and then a second um, page fault. And that's what SMEP does, basically. Right? Out of the box, it prevents all your exploits uh, from working. So that's what we're talking about today. Let me just switch back to my... All right, so this is uh, um, an AWS instance um, that I've created in June, July 2014, so Amazon instance. Um, and if uh, you list the CPU flags, so uh, process information, you'll see that this CPU is E52650, and there is no SMEP support right, back in 2014. But since then, they've started upgrading their architecture using new processes, and this instance was created in January 2015, right? It's a slightly newer CPU model, so it's E52670, and there is SMEP support, right? So at the moment, at least you'll get SMEP on most architectures, right? SMEP uh, access protection is still in the uh, sort of, in, in its development phase, but you'll get SMAP. So the agenda for this talk is um, I'll talk about previous work uh, briefly, um, uh, research in this area. Uh, then we'll start with the introduction and the typical return to user attacks, how they work, how kernel exploits work, Linux kernel exploits. And then we'll talk about uh, SMAP and SMAP bypasses. Um, in particular, we'll consider two cases. So the first case is when you have a SMAP-enabled CPU, so a five-year breach or later, and you've got a stock kernel. So what I mean by stock kernel is something that comes with your distribution. Right? So if you install Ubuntu, Fedora, whatever you like, it comes with the kernel. And the second case is you've got SMAP and SMAP, um, uh, and you've got arbitrary memory writes. Right? So it's a stronger assumption. You've got arbitrary memory write primitive, um, but you don't need a stock kernel in that case. And the second part is more sort of practical, uh, where we take the existing CVE, there is an existing exploit, and we just convert that existing exploit to the one that bypasses SMEP, right? And you'll see that the modifications that you need to introduce are minimal, right? Okay, so in terms of previous work, uh, there was uh, some research done uh, by uh, Dan Rosenberg back in 2011, uh, even before we had SMEP. Uh, so he provided just some general ideas how to bypass SMEP, so using kernel rob, things like that, writing into the bias area. Um, and then they did this talk with uh, Obi Heide um, on stack jacking, right? That was kind of big uh, in 2012. Uh, and the idea was is if you've got the kernel stack leak, you know the address of the kernel stack. So you can find the address of the thread info data structure that contains all the parameters for the, uh, for the current process, right? So UID, uh, GID, things like that. So if you know the address of the data structure, you can write into address limit uh, variable. If you set it to zero, that variable, then you can, from user space, write to any memory address in the kernel space, right? So you're removing this barrier between kernel space and user space. Pretty cool, but again, it requires arbitrary writes and kernel stack leaks, right? So you need two things. Uh, there was another... Um, uh, blog um, posted in 2012, November 2012, 
on uh, Jeet Spreen, just in time compiler. Uh, again, very cool, but there are some limitations. Obviously, first BPF um, stands for Berkeley Packet Filter. Uh, just in time compiler is not enabled by default. Right? But if you control the input to that compiler, if you enable it, then you can sort of produce your privilege escalation payload on the fly, right? doing just in time compilation. And recently, um, there was a very good research on uh, FISMAP exploitation techniques. Um, this was an actual academic paper. Um, I think it was first published in 2000, December 2012, and then presented at Black Hat in 2015. Um, so this is basically using the shared FISMAP area, um, which is, uh, it, it basically maps your entire RAM on 64-bit um, processes or it partially maps your RAM on 32-bit processes, right? And then you've got aliases to memory addresses. So, for example, you can have a virtual uh, memory address in kernel space and a virtual memory address in user space mapping to the same physical page, right? So if you write your payload in user space, it will emerge in kernel space. And if you find that address in kernel space, then you don't need to access user space and you can just execute your payload entirely in the kernel space, right? Pretty cool, but again, there were some mitigations introduced. So first of all, page map. So if you go to proc um, slash process ID page map, it's not readable by any user anymore. You need root privileges. And that's how they um, used to find page frame numbers, right? To find this address in um, a physical address of that page. So it's not readable anymore. Uh, there are some spraying techniques that they provided, but they're not as reliable. Okay, so there is a chance that your kernel is going to crash. Um, and yeah, the people discussed it. They, they said, yeah, this is a security um, issue, and we should make those pages non-executable. So map the entire FIS map non-executable. Right? And they've done it in OpenBSD, for example. Not, not in the Linux kernel yet. All right, so we'll start with the... Um, Typical return to user attack attacks. This is how every single exploit nowadays works. Right? So you probably know that Linux kernel, uh, it's a kernel space on behalf of user space. Um, and what that means is the kernel space is mapped into every process, into virtual space of every process, right? At some high memory addresses. And user space processes obviously cannot access kernel space. Right? If I'll try to you know, write to some high memory addresses, I'll get a seg fault. Um, but kernel space can access user space. Right? So if I'm running with um, elevated privileges in the kernel, um, then I can access user space. Right? And return to user attacks, they take advantage of this, and they basically redirect the control flow, the kernel control flow, from kernel space to user space. Right? So you host your payload in user space and you jump from kernel space to user space and execute it. Right? So pretty simple. Um, this is just uh, how it works visually. Uh, there is this memory split in the kernel. Right? So there's user space and kernel space. Kernel space is loaded at the high memory addresses. So let's just consider a 64-bit architecture for now. Um, so kernel space is... Um, uh, there's this task size uh, a variable, which is 47 bits minus one guiding page, right? So anything above that is kernel, anything below that is user space, okay? And the idea is that if you've got some uh, memory corruption issue in the kernel, you can, for example, a function pointer, and you can corrupt that function pointer somehow. You can just redirect the control flow to user space to your uh, privilege escalation payload hosted in user space, right? So pretty simple. Or if you've got some kind of data structure pointer, not a function pointer, you can just build a fake data structure in user space that contains pointers, redirect control flow to the data structure, and then redirect control flow to your privilege escalation payload. Right. So this is just in a, in a nutshell. So option one, uh, corrupted function pointer. So you find a function pointer to overwrite, uh, and then and map your privilege escalation payload in user space, All right? So the typical privilege escalation payload looks like this. You're using two functions, uh, commit creds and prepare kernel creds, 
uh, functions, right? So commit creds creates a, a new credential structure, and commit creds applies it to the current process, right? So you, if you create a new uh, credential structure with UID zero, then you just apply it to your process, and you become root, right? And yeah, so escalate previs is just using those two functions. Prepare kernel create zero creates a null kernel uh, credential structure uh, with UID zero and then applies it. And then you just trigger that vulnerable function to execute your privilege escalation payload. This is the simplest case, right? So yeah, a basic unit of credentials, um, prepare kernel cred, allocates and returns a new structure, and commit creds applies uh, the new credentials. Right, so what if you've got, and, and this is just a visual representation of how it works, right? Um, what function pointers do you normally overwrite? There are many function pointers in the kernel, right? These are just some examples, so ptmx, fops, uh, perf fops. So if you just grep something in the kernel, uh, so you take boot system map and grep for underscore ops or f ops, you'll find a few data structures that contain pointers. So take any of those data structures, um, any of those functions in the, those data structures and just overwrite them, right? And you've got your privilege escalation payload executed. Option number two, okay, so instead of having this uh, function pointer in the kernel, you've got a, a data structure pointer. So a pointer that points to a data structure. Um, in that case, it's pretty much the same idea, but what you do is you take is you create this uh, fake data structure in user space, and then you, you redirect the control flow from your kernel space data structure to user space data structure that contains pointers, right? And the rest is exactly the same. And this is what it looks like. So this is my um, vulnerable uh, data structure pointer. It's not a function. So what I do is I compare this Place, and that data structure contains pointers. So I'm here, and then I execute this function A to create my payload. Okay, so when uh, privilege escalation payload completes, you just do a simple return. Um, so we're, we're not modifying stack, stack is what it should be, and then you just execute system bin sh right, at that point, and you get root. So your privilege have uh, been escalated, and you can just run system uh, bin sh. And you get a clean exit, obviously. Okay, so what SMEB does, um, uh, this is taken from the uh, uh, Intel data sheet of volume one. So the processor introduces a new mechanism that provides next level of system protection by blocking malicious software attacks from user mode code when the system is running in the highest privilege level. Okay. Right? So, and that's what that oops message looks like that I showed you previously. So you basically get a double fault as the message, uh, as the reason for the oops. And if you look at the um, CR4 register, you'll see this value 1407F0 in hex. Right? So for now, just try to remember that value. This value is static. Uh, so. All right, this is what this CR4 register looks like. All right, so have a look at the uh, SMEP and SMEP fields. So let's just consider SMEP for now as a condition of protection, this is bit number 20. Um, and if this bit is one, then SMEP is enabled. If this bit is zero, then SMEP is disabled. All right, and this is that value, 1407F0. Um, right. And that bit in, highlighted in red is that SMEP bit. So if you flip it to zero, then you'd be disabling SMEP. Okay, so if CR4 SMEP is one, instructions may not be fetched from any user mode address. All right, makes sense, and that's why we're getting that oops error message. All right, so it tries to go from kernel space to user space, and then you get this um, a fault, a double fault. Uh, but the good news is that CR4 register can be modified using standard move instructions. Right? So if I do something like this, move this um, 1407E0 into CR4 register, it's a valid instruction. The processor will execute it, and I'm going to override the value in the CR4 register. 
right? And this value actually disables SMIP, right? So it's E0, not F0, okay? So I've flipped a single bit. All right, so um, you've seen that. Uh, to check that SMIP is enabled, you just do uh, cat proc CPU info and grab SMIP. If it's there, then it's enabled. Um, to disable it, you do no SMIP to the kernel, like provide it as a boot parameter to the kernel. Um, and lastly, in terms of hypervisors, um, and this is just based on my own testing, Zen and VMware, they provide SMIP support. Right? So if your CPU is SMIP enabled, then the, uh, the hypervisor will use it. VirtualBox, Hyper-V, currently there is no SMEP support. This is as of probably December last year. Um, and uh, this is not documented, but if you set your um, virtual hardware version to number 8 or below in VMware, right, if you just take that VMX file and edit it by hand and set it to 8 or less, then SMEP is, is disabled. Right? Even though your CPU supports it, it will be disabled. All right, so let's consider the first case in terms of bypasses um, when you've got SMEP um, and a stock kernel. This is the most common case, right, for any consumer um, system or even, you know, cloud providers, uh, service providers. All right, so let's introduce ROP. So you probably all know about ROP, return-oriented programming. Um, you can do kernel return-oriented programming. It's the same thing, but you operate on the kernel. All right, so I'm not sure if you know the differences between VM Linux and VM Linux, Linux, right? So one is the actual ELF binary file and the, the other one is a compressed image. So you have to make sure that you're using the uncompressed image, the actual ELF file. Um, and to get that file, uh, some distributions provide IPM files, deb files, depending on the distributions, uh, or you can just extract the, the compressed file. Right. If you want to extract the compressed file, uh, this tool is provided in the Git repository, Linux kernel Git repository, extract VM Linux, and you provide the compressed image, and you get the actual ELF file out of it. Right? Um, so that's what you should see uh, in terms of differences. So VM Linux, it's an ELF 64-bit, uh, and if you take the actual kernel, the compressed kernel, it will be something like Linux kernel boot executable uh, BZ image. Right. Okay, so how do you find gadgets um, in the Linux kernel? Well, I've heard people say, well, use, use opt dump, right? The most common technique that you use for user space. Um, there are some problems with that, and I'll cover them in a second. So, um, opt dump works with aligned memory addresses only, right? So, this is the entry point. It takes that address and then dumps all the assembly instructions from that entry point. And you're limiting your space like Rob Gadget space to only align memory addresses. But if you use different offsets, then you'll get much more uh, instruction, like many other possibilities for um, gadgets. So it's better to use a tool that's designed specifically uh, to work with the ELF file to find Rob um, Gadgets. Uh, one of those tools is uh, Rob Gadget, right? Uh, there are many others, but um, that's what I normally use. So the uh, command line would be something like Rob Gadget binary, and this is your uncompressed ELF image, and um, it just gives you all the um, gadgets in the kernel. And just mind you, it uses the Intel syntax. Like the first time I used it, um, I plugged it in, my kernel crashed, and I'm like, well, what's happening? So I was thinking it's using the, uh, the gas syntax. All right, so um, this is the reason why you should be using Rob Gadget. Uh, you probably know about the IE32 language density. So there's this concept of language density, meaning that uh, the instruction set for Intel is so big that if you take any sequence of bytes, it, it can be interpreted as a valid instruction. Right? So if I take this instruction here, uh, 0F94C3, this is this instruction. Not very useful. Right? Not a very useful gadget, but if I do offset of 1, then this becomes 94C3, and this is a, a pivot instruction, right? typically used in, in ROP. So that, that's why you have to use a proper tool. Some stack pivots, useful stack pivots, uh, and you probably know most of them. So 
uh, first replace the value of RSP, the stack pointer, with some register, RAX, RBX, RDX, depending on what you can control, right? You can add something to the stack register, uh, so to, to either, you know, a positive offset or a negative offset to go in space, or you can use the exchange instruction sort of swaps the values of the two registers, again, RAX, RBX, RDX with RSP. And um, the one that we're actually interested in is this exchange instruction for 32-bit registers, right? So you're running on a 64-bit kernel, but you're using a 32-bit exchange instruction. And the reason for that is if you take RAX register, right? For example, RAX equals uh, 0xFFF dead beef, and you swap it with some other register, like with RSP. Uh, if you use that instruction here, exchange, say, EAX with ESP, your ESP becomes dead beef. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so it's a 32 bit instruction. So it chops off the, the first part, part 0xFFFF, and uses dead beef. So this value is loaded into the stack register, um, and at that point, your stack points to user space, because that beef resides in user space. All right, so what happens when you take your pivot instruction that, that's not an executable uh, uh, page, right? So some pages in the kernel are read-only, for example, uh, write-only or read-write. So depending on the permissions, if there is no executable flag set, you'll get this error message saying kernel tried to execute an uh, non-executable protected page, exploit attempt. So, um, and you get a, a, a kernel crash. Uh, if that happens, so what do you have to do? Just find another pivot. Find another instruction that's in, in the executable page. And believe me, there are many possibilities. Like The, the kernel is huge. All right, so in general, this is how it works. Um, uh, so you start with your uh, vulnerable um, data pointer, right? So you've got some data structure in the kernel, and you can control that pointer to the data structure. You can corrupt it. Um, so what you do is you basically redirect the control flow to user space, so similar to case two that I showed you previously. Um, and that data structure contains a pointer, a function pointer, in user space. Right? So you make that pointer point back to kernel space to your pivot instruction, to that stack exchange instruction. So it goes back to kernel space. Um, and then once you execute the stack pivot instruction, your stack now is in user space. Right, so this is this uh, fake stack ROP payload, that's what we call. And that's where we put our ROP chain. Right? So it's still in user space, but now it's on the stack, basically. And then we just execute that standard privilege escalation payload as, as a ROP chain. So commit, prepare creds, commit creds, uh, but as a ROP chain. And you've got your root access. Right? So you're never, going, you're never executing any instructions in user space. So you're always in the kernel. Every time you try to execute a, um, an instruction, it always resides in the kernel, right? Stack can be in user space. So this is a stack. So you're not actually executing instructions. You're fetching instructions from the stack. OK. Uh, for the payload, stack, um, fake stack payload, you've got two options. You can disable SMEP as a ROP chain. Uh, and then call your privilege escalation, the standard privilege escalation payload in user space. Or you can do the entire SMAP and privilege escalation payload as a ROP chain. I typically do the first option, just makes it easier. The ROP chain is smaller, so basically you move that value uh, of CR4 register. So you flip the bit, overwrite the value, and then you can do whatever you like. Right? So you can go back to um, user space and execute your uh, payload. All right, so um, this is what a, um, a ROP chain would look like just at a high level. Uh, you've got your uh, the value for the register, like CR4 value. So you pop that value into, say, RAX or 
some other register. Then you XOR that value with FFFFF and that disables this MEB bit and then you move that value into the CR4 register and then you call your jump to your privilege escalation payload. Right? This is at a high level. Um, so how do, you, how do you get this value of the CR4 register? Well, um, there is no support for in GDB, so you cannot just do, you know, print the value of CR4 register. Um, but what I showed you previously, you could just crash the kernel and look at the CR4 value and you'll see it's static, it doesn't change. So just take that value. All right, so in terms of uh, fake stack, when you execute that um, stack pivot instruction, when you exchange the stack register, um, with some other register, so you set your RSP to dead beef, um, and then you jump to that uh, memory address and user space. Um, so great, right? If you can control this REX register, right? So if I know that the REX at the time of the uh, when I trigger the vulnerability is FFFF dead beef, then I know that my RSP will be dead beef. But what if I cannot control REX or any other register? Right, so the value could be random in that register. Well, in that case, uh, what you do is you just allocate approximately four gigs of memory in user space. So you map the entire user space, um, and then you spread with your ROB payload. Right, if that makes sense. So, so an entire four gigs, and then anywhere you jump in user space, right? Even if you don't control that RX register, let's say it's just random value, you're still gonna get to user space to your op chain. Cool. And again, we've got a few options here. If we do something like this, the spraying, so first rope instruction, second rope instruction, third rope instruction, and so on, and just keep repeating it, it's not really gonna work. I mean, it may work. Right? It may work if you, let's say, when you do the stack pivot, you land here, right, to the first instruction. Then you're good, right? Then you execute the first, second, third, and you exit. But what if you land into, like, the middle of your op payload? So let's say to the, uh, you know, second or third instruction. Well, in that case, uh, it's just going to crash. Um, and the alternative is to spray the stack with RSP advancing gadget. That's what I call it. So <laughs> what I mean by RSP advancing gadget is something that advances the stack. Right? So take any instruction like pop something and return. Right? Or maybe nop return. So do nothing, return, remove something from the stack. Do nothing, return, remove something from the stack. So you spray the four gigs of, well, let's say four gigs minus one page with that gadget. And then you put your payload into the last page. So it's it, it, similar concept to the knob sled, right? But it's, it's sort of, it's advancing the, the stack. Um, right. Yeah, so that's what I mean by this uh, stack advancing gadget. So you spread with ROP RX return, ROP RX return, and then you've got your actual um, ROP chain, privilege escalation ROP chain. So you're going to execute all the um, gadgets on the stack and then get to your ROP chain eventually. All right, so um, this was case number one when you've got SMIP and you've got a, a stock kernel. So now um, let's consider that you've got a, a Skylake CPU or um, a Broadwall CPU and you've got both SMIP and SMAP enabled but you have arbitrary rights. And this is pretty common in, in kernel exploitation. You quite often have arbitrary rights or you can turn some vulnerabilities into arbitrary rights. Um, so SMAP and SMAP, meaning that I cannot go to user space. I cannot fetch instructions from user space. I cannot execute instructions from user space. Right? It's just I can't go to user space. All right, so what we do in that case, um, we abuse VDSO. Um, you've probably heard about uh, virtual syscalls, if there are any uh, Linux people in this room. Um, this is basically a mechanism to speed up certain uh, system calls in the kernel. Right? There are standard system calls and there are virtual system calls. Um, standard system call is you've got this context switch. Right? When you go from user space to kernel space, back from kernel space to user space. And th this introduces some overhead. And if you take a system call that's frequently executed, something like get time of day, 
right? This is not very efficient. So instead, they introduced virtual syscalls. For syscalls that are safe, right? They don't modify any memory. Uh, there is a page uh, mapped in user space. It's a kernel page. Let me just show this to you. So it's, it's this one here, the last one. It says vsyscall. And you'll see this is a, a kernel memory address, right? It's, it's static. It doesn't change. Even if you've got kernel ASLR, it, it's fixed, all right? So this page is accessible from user space. I can execute instructions residing in, in that page. Right? And I'm not going to get any uh, you know, page faults or anything like that. And that was the idea. So you eliminate, the, eliminate this context switch and you go from, and you just execute um, syscalls in kernel space. But then they realized this was a, a security issue, obviously, because it's static. Right? This address doesn't change. I can just write my instructions to, to this page, this syscall, sorry. And then in kernel space, I can then you know, execute those instructions. So instead, they introduced this uh, VDSO, and it stands for Virtual Dynamic uh, Shared Object. Okay, so basically, it's a shared object that's loaded into every process, the virtual space of every process. Um, same idea, it does exactly the same thing. It executes those get time of day special system calls. Uh, but this time, it's, um, it's actually implemented in user space, right? So this is the memory address of VDSO, and it's in user space. And if you run it multiple times, you'll see that it's randomized, right? So every time, if ASLI is enabled, you'll see different addresses every time. So potentially, you, you can't use it from user space, right? Even if you know the address. Cool, but it's fixed in kernel space. Right, so the user space address is randomized, but the uh, kernel address space is the same. So the base address for uh, VDSO is that. So I've tested the 3.13, 3.19 kernels, and they all have the same fixed address. Um, 4.2 was slightly different. So, but again, it'd be the same for a certain branch of kernels. Um, right, so. If you extract VDSO, as I said, VDSO is just a standard uh, shared object, right? So this is Python script that just reads virtual memory of the process and extracts that um, SO file, right? So I've extracted it, and then if you run, say, file on it, you'll see it's just a standard ELF 64-bit file. Yeah, so you can, it, it's an ELF file, you can just do read ELF, and dump all the symbols in that file. Um, and I'm interested in that instruction here, highlighted get time of day. Uh, you can see that that instruction is, the instruction is 433 bytes in size. That's pretty big for my uh, privilege escalation payload. Right? I've got enough space. So what I can do is basically take the offset of that instruction, D30, plus the base address, and then I get the address in kernel where um, this function is, right? And I can just overwrite that function. The page is mapped as read-write, VDSO page. So from kernel space, I can just write my privilege escalation payload into that VDSO object, and it's going to be loaded by every process, right? So what this uh, privilege escalation payload looks like, it's just a standard. Um, Privilege escalation payload on Linux, not the kernel escalation payload, like prepare creds, commit creds, but the, uh, the user space one. So for example, take the reverse shell. Reverse shell back to local host, right? So, but what you'll have to do is uh, in your shell code is first check if the UID is zero of the process. Is there are many uh, uh, you know, processes on your Linux system using get time of day. They're all going to call get time of day. Some of them have UID 0, others are not. You're only interested in UID 0. So what you do is you check if the UID is 0, and then you execute your reverse shell. And then you just listen with netcat on your local host, and you get a shell back. As simple as that. So you never go to uh, kernel space, uh, from kernel space to user space. The entire privilege escalation payload is executed in user space. And that bypasses um, SMAP and SMAP. Right? So pretty cool idea. Uh, finally, um, I'm not sure if we've got time for this. 
do we? It's uh, five minutes. All right, let's do a quick one. Um, so just to show you how this ROP chain works, and it's pretty easy to implement this ROP chain, I've uh, taken this uh, CVE, and the reason, um, so this is my target system, is just Ubuntu 12.04.02, 3.5 kernel, and U is Ivy Bridge. Ah, oh, cool, yeah. What were you trying to make? I can't hear you in the back. Ah, oh, okay, sorry. All right, so th this is the target system. Um, uh, the reason I've decided to use the CVE is affects a small range of kernels, right, so 3.3 to 3.8, um, and it's quite easy to understand. So if you've never done any kernel exploitation before, it's just a simple out-of-bounds access, right? So no previous knowledge required. Um, and I believe there is a public export for this as well, but it's only for 32-bit systems. So, um, right, so this is the vulnerable function. Uh, it's a sock diag uh, function, so there are some special sockets in the Linux kernel that you can create, um, and the the vulnerable code is here. All right, so you've got this sock diag handlers array, and there is this family um, array index, and you can control this family array index. Okay, so you can provide any value, so you can go plus any memory address or minus memory, any memory address in kernel space or user space, if you like. All right, so the idea is that you prepare this uh, sorg diag handlers. Um, this is your array with the index, right? So 45 is out of bounds. If you use the index of 45, for example, you'll go to user space. Um, and then you prepare your um, data structure, your sort of fake data structure in user space, sorg diag handler. And that data structure contains a function pointer called dump, right? So what you do is point that dump function pointer back to kernel space, uh, to your pivot instruction, right? And once you've swapped the, the stack, the, the, uh, the current stack with um, some REX or RBX value, you, um, uh, you point it to your fake uh, fake stack, right? And that's where you put your privilege escalation payload, the ROP chain, right? Th these are just some details how you do it. Um, so just map this area, put your privilege escalation, your ROP chain in there, spray the stack with this ROP um, advancing gadget. Um, and this is the actual ROP chain implemented. So if you take the same kernel version as I did, and by the way, the exploit is public, it's on GitHub if you want to take a look at that. Um, so you can, you can do ROP, uh, ROP gadget on it and you'll get the same memory addresses as I did. Right? It doesn't change. Uh, and then when you execute your ROP chain, you can do the IRET. IRET is basically returning from an interrupt, a standard instruction. It restores all the values, the user code segment, the user stack segment, and so on. And then you return to user space with the elevated privileges. All right, so just some details for you. I don't, I don't know if I've got time for the demo, but let's do a, a quick one. Okay, got that. So I'll use the same virtual machine. So I'm going to boot with SMAP. Okay, you can see that SMAP is enabled. So this is that uh, Sork Diag um, exploit. Again, it's public. Um, and this is that ROP chain that I was talking about. All right. Uh, I think it was compiled already. Uh, so let's hope it doesn't crash. Cool. All right. CPU info. Rep SMEP. So you can see that SMEP is still there, right? Even though I've disabled it in the register, it's actually zero at the moment, but it's still listed as um, enabled. 
and I can do a clean exit, right? So my kernel doesn't crash, I restore the stack pointer, and it's all good, and there is no oops messages in the log, okay? That's it, thank you. All right. Hello, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask two questions. Yep. Uh, in the first example that you, show, that you showed, you actually jump back to the user space, right? But isn't the user space virtually mapped? Like the, all, the, all the, vir the, the user space processes can see the kernel in the same address, but how does the kernel know what is the virtual addresses of the current user space process? It's mapped by the, this thread info structure. So when you execute a process, it actually knows that this is the current process running the uh, executing, right? So in place, um, let's say you've mapped, um, you know, page uh, 1,000 in hex to 2,000. So in kernel space, you reference that space for that particular process that called that uh, binary file, okay? And you just do, the, and it happens without you knowing, or without me knowing? Yes. Okay. And uh, and about the VDSO uh, exploitation. So to do that, you already need to have code execution in the kernel, right? Uh, yeah, you you need to have a vulnerability, some kind of memory corruption vulnerability. Okay, so it just makes it easier to exploit once you use it, right? Yeah, it, okay. it's basically how you bypass um, SMAP and SMAP, right? So you've got execution in the kernel, right? But let's say your CPU's got both enabled. If you do the standard privilege escalation payload, your kernel's gonna crash, mm -hmm. right? But if you write into VDSO and you do it that way, then you'll get root. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? No, no questions? Mm -hmm. All right, Vitaly, thank you very much. Thank you. Good.